um, corporate refugee. I don't know. Yes, it's interesting. I used to work for IBM, which is a lovely place to work. But uh, like many of your mentors, actually, you had one of those midlife epiphanies and thought, woke up one morning, I just did a sale for a million dollars, and I thought, is that it? And uh, I, yeah, it sounds corny. I just wanted to do something worthwhile in the world, so I took over Big Buddy at that point. So just briefly, Big Buddy is the need is boys without fathers, of which there are thousands in New Zealand, and it's a rising figure. Um, according to our research, which and we're looking at boys aged seven to fourteen. That's the target age we work with in New Zealand. There's around about eight thousand who have no father whatsoever. Father was never there didn't have one, father died, and there's no active father in their life. And that's a very conservative estimate from our research based on some overseas stuff. Um, there's about uh, 50,000 boys of that age in sole parent families, but quite often there's a visiting father or a grandfather or an uncle. And, um, and uh, the problem, I don't like to talk about the negatives that much, but uh, fatherless boys are heavily overrepresented over in prisons, justice system, Etc. I've got a quote from Principal Youth Court Judge Andrew Beecroft, who's a good friend of ours. I'll read it because he is a judge. <laughs> I don't want to misquote him. He says that 83% of the youth offenders he sees in this court are male, and 70% of them come from solo parent families. And he said very few serious youth offenders come from stable two parent families. And he's careful to say, on the other hand, not every solo parent breeds a criminal. And he says, nor am I making judgments about separation. What I'm saying is that most serious young offenders lack a positive male role model. And that's from the judge's mouth. And any teachers you know who are in primary, intermediate, know those boys immediately. I've got a friend who's a teacher who says, oh, yeah, the fatherless boys, they're the ones holding onto my leg <laughs> at the end of class. So it's a, it's a rising trend. Um, and the evidence is that 80% yeah, of the men in prison uh, fatherless or have a very dysfunctional relationship with their father. So, And I'm not saying that, and we're trying to solve that problem, there's a big debate in social um, services at the moment about attribution or contribution. We think we're making a contribution to changing that figure, and I can see it. We've been around long enough to see the results. So what do we do? We um, recruit good men. Like I'm just looking at you now, I've got my recruiter, so I... Glasses on, yes. Good men from the community and uh, match them up with boys. We call them mentors, but they're father figures. They're father figures. This, the, we work within the field of fathering, really. And we match uh, those mentors up with boys in lifelong relationships. And we keep it really, really simple. Once the, the complicated bit is recruiting, and we do an extensive screening process, I'll talk about it in a minute but matching a, a bloke up into a boy's life, and of course there's a mum there involved as well, uh, all we're looking for is relationship. And I, as a CEO, I spend most of my time trying to keep it simple, because there's an enormous pressure in social services to make it complicated, and to sort of, you know, and what happens out of that relationship is pretty well a miracle, actually. Uh, all we ask the guys to do is to show up once a week and be yourself. That's, that's, that's the only thing we ask, two to three hours a week. That's the, the only ask. No, no end game, no goals, no project plans, no reporting back. And we try and encourage a real relationship to develop over that time. And out of that relationship comes everything. So um, we've been doing this since about 1997. It was originally started up by a group working with violent men in the non-violence field in Auckland, funded by the Crime Prevention Unit. Um, and uh, now we are funded by a broad range of philanthropic interests and a minion school, 10% from government. Which I like to say that on television quite often to embarrass people, but... Uh, so, and I don't want a lot of money from government. We don't, we don't want government too involved in this. This is, this is really grassroots human work. It's, it's not a lot to do with government. We've matched up our, uh, just over, by today, about 620 boys over that time with mentors and probably interviewed about 650 men uh, and, and seen the results from 97 all the way through. So now we've got boys who were seven when we first met them who are turning up, knocking on my door as blokes. Go, oh, you remember me? And I'm like, what? This little fellow like that and telling us their stories. So we're getting very strong narrative evidence of how their lives have been changed. So I'm getting social workers 
last week, a social worker in North Shore, Auckland, said, I think the two, uh, two boys on my list are alive today because of their mentors. And I said, oh, no, 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 it's not that flash. But it's interesting. Um, so um, one thing about keeping it simple is that we have to trust the men that turn up and we put into a boy's life. And uh, we don't do that lightly. Uh, so when I took this over back in around about just after 2000, it's the biggest problem in mentoring, and we get it in scouts and other areas, is can we trust this man to be alone with this boy? And so um, I took that seriously. I came out of a business background. I, t I just saw it as a business challenge, a problem. How do we solve this problem? So I spent quite a bit of time with psychologists who'd worked with child abusers, and I just asked questions and said, tell me about these people. What do they smell like? What do they look like? You know, how, how do their eyes twitch? And from that, we developed a very sophisticated screening process that can identify potential child abusers and people who are just chaotic, who can't really organise themselves. And our guys go through a series of interviews that they welcome. I used to apologise for all the... It's a, it's a three month screening process, it's quite intensive. I used to apologise seven years ago until one bloke said, oh, I don't want to join a bunch of bad apples, you know, give me the Warren Fitness. And now, our mentors have asked for a special card, which they get with a gold stripe on it, says they're an official big buddy mentor, so they can so show that to the school teacher or the doctor. And um, most men want that. It's interesting. We have one guy in uh, uh, Wellington, South Auckland, who just volunteered to get the screening done, because he had so many kids in his neighbourhood who wanted them to fix his bikes. He thought their parents would think, think he was a dodgy old guy, so he's got the, our letter up on his, on his wall on, uh, outside his garage. So. So uh, uh, that intensive screening process means that when we put the man in the boy's life, I totally trust him. We've done the background work. We, you know, we're doing, we know what we're doing, and we're not trying to monitor him. We're not trying to check up on him, which means we can allow relationship to happen, which means we can allow caring to happen. And at the guts of all this, I mean, that's the mechanics of what we do. And it's quite a lot of tricky stuff behind it, but what actually happens is that human caring happens over and over over again, week after week after week. And a little boy, seven-year-old boy, has been let down, possibly abused and beaten and all the rest of it, we get every single story, suddenly has a bloke, an ordinary bloke, show up in his life. And it's the showing up that does 80% of the work. It says, I, I turned up. I, I value enough to spend my time and turn up and say hello. That's it. And that changes everything in that boy's life. It changes his self-esteem, his self-worth. And now we have boys who are thinking of their future. But there's boys we met regularly who don't even think that future's a word that they should even think about. We met boys who have never been outside their suburb. Um, so they, they're starting to grow up thinking, oh, what do I want to be? And you know, all this sort of stuff. So this maturity is growing up in the boys. And of course, there's a guy alongside them. Judge Beecroft calls us alongsiders. He says, I think you're alongsiders, Richard. Not when somebody who's stepping alongside the boy as he grows up introducing him to the, to, the male, to the male world and introducing him to this idea of what does it mean to be a man. It used to be easy for my grandfather. That was pretty prescribed for my grandfather. It's a, lot, it's a lot more negotiable these days for these young fellas. What does it mean to be a man? And um, aside from the images they get from screens and stuff like that, it's much more subtle than that. So it's... And what, what happens is... Um, just as an aside, in social services, how am I going for time? Right. In social services, we have this thing called boundaries. You do this job. You do the alcohol bit, you do the violence bit, you do the little boy bit, and you heard the stories about you know five cars outside a house and all the rest of it. And that, uh, we get funding from SIFs, and I constantly have a battle with SIF to say, it's not enough funding to tell us what to do, we do it definitely to you. Give us some money and shut up, really. Uh, so the silos are just like, a silo for us would be you work with fatherless boys, the mentor turns up and just visits him, gives him an inspirational talk and walks away and does nothing else. And um, what I see happens is caring happens. This guy's turning up and saying, well look, I, I've seen what's happening with the mother, I've seen what's happening with him, I want to help him with school, and I'm meant to say no, 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 no. We dropped that, that whole lot about seven years ago, I thought, bugger it. I'm not going to get in the way of human caring. That's, that would be arrogant. So, and we're kind of slightly radical in so social services. We let it all happen. So, 
and it's amazing. The extreme end of that, we had a boy in Auckland whose mum was street worker, gang connected, heroin addict, who was allowed to see her boy every six months under, under police supervision. And I feel sorry for her, I don't know why her life ended up like that. That boy had her sister as a caregiver, she died. Her sister's friend was the next caregiver, she died. We had a mentor with that boy and his wife was involved, the wives get involved for four years and he'd run out of caregivers and was gonna go into the SIFS foster system, which you've been hearing about lately. And his mentor was a smart guy, he said, I don't want, don't want this boy in there, I want to adopt him. So I rang SIFS up and we did a deal and that boy now lives with that mentor. Now, in the UK, I'd probably lose my job. In New Zealand, I'd lose my job if I told too many people about that. I don't care. I'm old enough now, I really don't care. That's the right thing to happen at that point. That guy and his wife had developed a four-year relationship with this boy. That was parenting. And now we've got another boy who's been bouncing around foster care for seven years, and the only consistent person in his life is his mentor. Just a really ordinary bloke who just keeps showing up all the time. Fun hour placement, SIFS placement, fun hour placement, SIFS placement, all over the place, you know, a little bit into a care facility back again. And the only person is that mentor. And that boy says, why can't you be my dad? Why can't you be my dad? He said that to me. Why, why can't Barry be my dad? I said, he is. He is. So what happens is I'm discovering this grand old age of 63 is that it's fantastic. If you get out of the way of it, human caring takes care of everything. Not everything, but I think what we do in social services is we, we try and get outcomes. It's the last thing we've got. We try and change people. Uh, Judge Beecroft said, the pro he said, we've got too many uh, programs trying to change people and not enough programs just getting alongside and supporting people. So, and I've seen over and over again, this is just a couple of examples. So we've got mentors who form trusts for the kids' education, because some of our mentors get together. We've got wives of mentors become good friends with the mother. The mother is in strife, she, the wives and her friend go and help that mother through a, a hospitalisation crisis. We have fun hours starting to happen, just spontaneously. How about that? So it's kind of in social services, we've got all these silos of what you should do to fix the world. And we've got people who are just busting those silos out at the bottom, and I'm just thinking, okay, we'll just roll with this <laughs> and see where it goes. So it's inspirational to be around. Um, yeah. I think it's enough. I could give you more details. I don't know why. I went on to the generalities, but that's uh, the biggest thing that's emerged for me is however we do it, all it is is bloke, a bloke turning up into a boy's life. But what happens from that little kind of interaction of one person caring for another, it ripples out and the res on our uh, analysis report says we do a big ripple out and, and um, most of my job is making sure the ripple goes and we don't stop that. Questions? Very happy to answer. Heaps. Heaps of questions. So we'll start, start at the back. <coughs>so the question is what age and what's the transition or the graduation uh, 7 to 14 from hard won experience that's the ideal age around about 15 you go into a boys home and it's pretty well like that some you can crack through that but usually it's, they're too tough the 7 year old boy comes into your home I remember training one of my guys I went into this home he said are you the big buddy? I said, um, no, I'm the grand buddy. He said, well, where's the big buddy? He was hungry for it. You know, so it's seven. Our ideal is they never graduate. Our ideal is that it's an ongoing relationship for life. So many, many of our mentors say things like, I'll be there at his wedding. He'll be there at my funeral. And we've had two funerals so far. So it's the human story all the way through. Uh, what happens over time, that changes, you know, but... Yeah, it's a long-going relationship. Um, Wellington is fantastic. We get more mentors volunteering in Wellington relative to what we do to Auckland. I don't know why that is. You're just a lot, uh, you're bigger-hearted down here, maybe. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the, maybe it's the wind or the cold southerlies or something. No, you're not one any friends <laughs> making comments like that. <laughs> <laughs>
we had to do what in my old world was called marketing and sales. In the non-profit world, it's called awareness raising and promotion. Uh, I'll raise money, I'll do adverts, I get on the telly as soon often as I can, we do PR, we, we just get the word out there, we network, we start to build relationships with large businesses, we've got a relationship going with GJ Gardner Homes and ITM and all their subbies and contractors will start volunteering for us. So it's the hardest bit, the most tr uh, difficult bit of the lot because we only recruit men. And, Uh, we've got a really comprehensive database, so I came out of the IT space, so we've got a really switched on database and we talk to the mother and the mentor and the boy occasionally, but mainly the mother and mentor on a weekly basis have meetings, but phone calls and everything's logged and you start to build up a narrative over time and you can see what's happening and that gives us the feedback. So, and we, we sometimes we have to, mum's telling us stuff usually like, I can't believe the difference in my son's behaviour. And we feed that back to the mentor, and the mentor goes, well, I haven't done anything. And we go, oh, yes. And back and forth. So, yeah, we get it's a narrative, really, that tracks it. And we do surveys every now and again that ask specific questions of people. Last survey, the biggest thing that blew me away was a large number of women and the mentors reported that their relationships with other people had improved since being involved with us. Go figure. Um. Most of our budget spent on people, so I have a guy in Wellington who does, we go out to people's homes and we interview the boys, we interview the mum, we do some background checking, we want to find out what happened to that boy's dad, there's a little bit of detective work there and interviewing with the, with the male mentors and all the rest of it. So it's mainly um, salaries and keeping people in an office and promotion. So around about, at the moment, we're about 600 grand a year to run Auckland and Wellington. We're just opening up with help from GJ Gardner Homes and Hamilton next year. That will be about 100,000 a year. So um, uh, promotion, we spend money on, which is unusual for non-profits. That's my business background. I thought, you know, we've got to get out there and get this message. We can't just network it. So we, we'll advertise in local papers and try and get on the telly, we advertise it. Radio works well too. The biggest surprise was how deep this goes. Uh, I had no idea. I thought we were just helping out some boys that didn't have dads. Uh, the biggest surprise was when that couple adopted the boy, when uh, I met mothers crying and saying, I think my boy's alive because of this. Uh, another surprise, I had a mother came and see me, and my biggest surprise was how wide it spreads out. I had a mother come and see me, she said, I always felt guilty about my boyfriends, you know, her husband died, you know, because I was looking for a boyfriend and a father for my son at the same time, and I could never get the, them right. Uh, and she says, since he's had a big buddy, I'm only looking for a, a man for myself. And she said, I feel hugely relieved, hugely relieved. Uh, I never thought that was going to come in. Yeah, so I'm, I'm constantly surprised at the ripple out, endless ripple out. Um, we've had, we get a wide range of boys and we, we're not looking for at-risk boys. We, every, any boy that doesn't have a father qualifies. So we've got boys whose dad was a wealthy millionaire who rolled over from a heart attack last year. And he's just as welcome as the young boy from West Auckland who's in a criminal family. Um, so the ones that we get, we know they're on the edge. Uh, none of them have ended up in youth justice, but they were potential. You know, you talk to the local social workers and say, oh, we know that family's going to produce another one. Uh, they haven't. We've got one boy who came from a really, really abusive, violent background and he got brain damage from the beatings. And I was in court with him uh, a month ago, and he never got charged. And he was desperate not to get a charge on it on because it, that would ruin his future, which is an extraordinary achievement. It doesn't sound much, but to get a boy from a heroin addicted mother, violence, gang violence, and all the rest of it, we got him at seven, he's now 15, going on 16, saying, 
I want a future. I don't want a criminal conviction to stop me. So I talk to the judge, and he won't he won't go down that system. So, but we don't actively work with boys in the in the youth justice system. That's probably we're, we're why it was funded by the crime prevention unit in the beginning is that we're long term. So our mentor would have been there at seven, when all hell breaks loose and the hormones break out at 14. That's when the trouble happens. He's got a mentor alongside him saying, "Ah." Oh, yeah, you have, have to think about that. You know, do you really want to do that? And that happens over and over again. So. The boys usually come directly from the mothers. That's our preference. We have a referral. Don't mean at <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're getting an increasing number of mothers at, with one or two year old boys saying, can they get them on the waiting list? <laughs> Um, it's the mums have found out about us, or the caregivers, or grandparents raising their grandchildren. That's a big one. Uh, SIFs, we get involved with SIFs, school teachers, and the, the um, services around schools that deal with behavioural problems, um, RTLBs and others, will refer to us. But we always try and have a relationship with the mum because I'm aware that this mum's got to trust us because we're going to put a strange guy into her boy's life. So, yeah. Okay. But the mothers get onto us. Faster than the internet, actually. It's amazing that that, that network. Richard, that's been fantastic. Great. I'm going to get Denise to formally thank you, so if you'd like to take the seat, thank okay. you very much. <clears throat> Richard, thank you so much. I think you've inspired us this afternoon with three things that you've done. You've reminded us just how significant the challenge is for New Zealand as a community uh, in having young men grow up without contact with, with, a, um, with a male figure who is not necessarily, not their dad, but someone that they can really look up to, up to. So you've told us about the challenge. You've told us about the terrific work that your organisation does, and you're in the, the field of fathering, and I think we're all going to go away knowing a little bit more, and I know you've got a stack of brochures there. Uh, and that perhaps people in the room might take away some of those, if not yourself, someone that you can think of who could be one of these uh, significant figures. But then I think you went on to give us some lessons from your own organisation's learning that really ring true for us as an organisation uh, as well. And I'll just mention a few of those. You have to have optimism, don't you, in the most dire of circumstances. And Richard, you said that miracles happen. You see them. Uh, the second is it doesn't have to be particularly complicated in lots of volunteering for good. Show up and be yourself. Uh, and, uh, and the label of alongsiders. You don't have to change someone's life, just be there in their life for them. And the last one that uh, I take away is don't get in the way of human caring. Thank you so much, Richard, and ask everyone to join me in thanking you.